Hi there, and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome Mark Maslin, the Professor of Climatology from the University College London. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for inviting me on your programme. It's great to have you here. And this is like the first of a series of interviews that we're going to do together. So I'm super excited. Oh, I am. I mean, it's great to be able to talk about climate change and actually have someone who really understands and knows why we're actually doing all this sort of research. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about really like a one-on-one -on -one session with you. So it's going to be really exciting to go over the main points and the historical elements, especially from a scientific point of view, which is all evidence-based. So that's what we need right now. Well, thank you. I mean, I think sometimes what's most important is we give people the tools to understand climate change. It's not complicated and therefore giving people the facts means then they can actually understand why we're so worried about it and the sort of things we need to do in the future to actually combat it. Today, what I'd like to do is try to give you some understanding of the climate crisis. And I love this cartoon because it sort of puts COVID and climate change into context. What it shows is that we've always been worried about flattening the curve of COVID. And what's interesting is despite a global pandemic, the whole worry and the politics of climate change has actually continued unabated. And therefore, it's something that we're really going to have to deal with in the next couple of years. What people don't seem to realize is that the science of climate change is incredibly old. Eunice Foote in the 19th century in America, she showed that if you had two tubes of glass, one full of air, one full of CO2, and you put them out in the sunlight, the one with the CO2 got hotter and remained warmer for longer. The greenhouse effect. John Tyndall, five years later, actually showed with this beautiful piece of equipment, he was able to actually measure the amount of heat absorption and the heat given out by different gases, including water vapor and, of course, CO2. So what is climate change? So we all know that our climate comes from the sun. The sun produces lots of energy, mainly in the visible light, and that passes through the atmosphere, almost invisible to the energy. The only small bit that is actually absorbed is UV radiation by ozone, which is great for us because it stops uh, skin cancer and DNA damage. And about a third of that energy is reflected straight back into space off of white ice sheets, white clouds, you know, just reflected back into space. The other two thirds hits the earth. And if you think about sitting on that tropical island, which I know is difficult during COVID, but if you think about it, when you lie in the sun, you feel hot. And the reason being is that solar energy, which is light, hits your skin, converts to heat, and then you radiate that heat out. And that's exactly what the earth does. It gives off that heat. Now, the great thing is the greenhouse gases, which are in order of importance, water vapor, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxides, hold on to that heat a little bit and then radiate that back out, keeping a nice warm blanket around the planet. If you took all the greenhouse gases out, the temperature of the Earth would drop by about 30 degrees Celsius. Do not even think about how cold that would make an English summer and winter. So what we've been doing is we've been adding to this. And Guy Callender was the first to show that the world was warming up. And in 1938, he basically plotted all the global data they had at the time, 147 weather stations, and showed that there were a, a distinct correlation with the changes in CO2 in the atmosphere. That's 1938. Now we've got data for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from 1958 all the way through to the present day. And it's measured in parts per million. And as you can see, we've gone from about 315 when Keeling first measured CO2 
in Mauna Loa in Hawaii, up to nearly 420 parts per million today. So we have put in 50% more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than before the Industrial Revolution. And it's the, at its highest level for at least 3 million years. So we have a look at that past. This is the last 800,000 years stretching back. And you can see uh, the cycles of methane and CO2 going up and down naturally with the great ice ages. And these air bubbles within the ice cores really show us how this uh, atmospheric uh, CO2 methane have varied. And what we've done in the last 150 years, due to the Industrial Revolution, is taken us completely out of that natural cycle. As I said, CO2 have increased by 50% and methane has doubled. But what else has changed? Can we see other examples of climate change around the world? So if we have a look at Northern Hemisphere spring snow cover, and this is a really depressing graph for any of you who like skiing or even snowboarding, because it's just going down. If we look at the Arctic summer sea ice extent, that's been going down since 1960. If we think about the heat content of the ocean, and the oceans are huge, they cover 70% of the Earth, and they have a depth of average of about three kilometers, can hold a huge amount of heat. And that has gone up markedly over the last couple of decades. And of course, sea level has gone up every single year since the 1900s. So this is all evidence of climate has already started to change. And if we look at annual global temperatures, you can see that over the last 150 years, we've increased the temperature of the Earth by 1.1 degrees. And I'm showing at the bottom, so not everybody gets graphs. I mean, graphs are very scientific. So Ed Hawkins from Reading University, brilliant professor of climatology, decided let's just make them into color stripes. And the great thing is that you can actually download the software and you can make your stripes for your hometown, for your country, your city, anywhere you're interested in. So this is London temperatures from 1850 to 220. And as you can see, it basically goes from blue to very red. Now, this has also spawned the cottage industry. So yeah, you can have a tie, you know, with the temperatures on. You can, you can if you can afford a Tesla, you can even wrap your Tesla in the stripes, uh, t-shirts, and of course, leggings if you want. The, the, the memes are endless that you can use. So what about the future? Because that's great. We know climate change is happening. We know it's because of the greenhouse gases. But what about the future? Now, as a scientist, I would love to have lots of little Earths and play with them. But we've only got one. So what we do is we build different Earths in supercomputers. And we do it by having a net, so model the actual sort of like surface of the Earth. We then model into the ocean, into the atmosphere, and into the soils. And on the right hand side, this shows you how far the models have come. So these are the different climate assessment reports from 1990 through to 2013. And this is the resolution of the model. So in 1990, Britain was still part of Europe, no Brexit jokes there. By the time we get to 2013, the resolution has dropped down to 100 kilometers. And this is because of the huge increase in computer power. And all you have to do is pick up your mobile phone and actually realize how far we've come with that computer power. The really strange thing is the message has changed. And actually, the model outputs from 1990 seem, show exactly the same thing as our improved higher resolution models of today. So what do these models show us? So we have great science. We have great physics. We understand the uh, atmospheric chemistry. We understand all those interactions. The biggest problem with all these models is us, people. What are we going to do in the future? 
So there are different scenarios that we imagine. So here we have in red, no climate policy. So the idea that basically the world just ignores it and just goes, we're just going to carry on as usual. 4.5 to 5.4 degrees warming in the future. If we take all the current policies, we can possibly get to 3.1, 3.7 degrees Celsius. If we take the pledges and all of those uh, uh, political statements and we say they are 100% successful, we might be able to uh, get it to 2.6 to 3.2 degrees. And then there's these two pathways. The first one is the two degree pathway, whereby politicians in Paris, in the climate negotiations, agreed to keep the climate of the Earth to two degrees. Remember, we've already warmed it by 1.1 degree. And they also added an aspirational target of 1.5 degrees. Incredible politics, however, the actual challenge of getting to these is a lot larger than people realize. So what does that mean for Britain? So summers in Britain will be like those of 1976, 2007 and 2008. Incredibly hot and dry. And I'm sorry, I hide in a geography department. So this is a picture of Dungeness, which is the only desert that actually occurs in the United Kingdom. They are. That's good for your pub quiz. So 2003 was the worst heat wave to hit Europe up to now. And this is the nighttime temperatures in London in August 2003. It sort of shows you why lots of people want to live in Richmond upon Thames as opposed to sort of like in the center of the city. And the key thing is that this actually affects the mortality rate. So we saw that in Europe, there were over 70,000 excess deaths in Europe just from one heat wave. Okay? Compare that with some of the excess deaths due to COVID. But nobody decried a public emergency due to the heat waves. So there were two peaks. There was one in July and one in August for temperatures. And you can see the blue line is the mortality rate jumps up markedly. And it is actually the old and the frail who actually pass away at night time because they can't manage their temperatures. But the maximum temperature we got in the UK was 34 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which if you talk to friends of mine in Africa or in, say, Texas, they go spring. So it's not the temperature, it's how prepared a society is to deal with these heat waves. So what is the risk in the future? So if we can keep to a one and a half degree pathway, it means that one in four years will be as warm as 2003 and 2018. If we go up to a two degree pathway, one in two, every other summer will be that hot. Once we get to a three degree pathway, every summer will be that hot and there'll be heat waves on top of that. They'll also remember the winters are getting warmer and wetter and we've seen all the floods around the United Kingdom. And we're also concerned about increasing sea level and increased storm surges because of course that threatens our coastlines and to be really dramatic this is what London would look like if it was flooded. Just imagine the huge damage to the property market. Now, I can reassure you that the Environment Agency takes climate change very seriously, and they have plans to deal with up to a four meter rise in sea level. The worst predictions that we have from the climate models is 1.4 meters by the end of this century. So we will be protected from these sort of floods by the Environment Agency. But we also get these sharp cold snaps like the beast from the east because what's happened is we've melted the sea ice above Norway all the way into Russia. So these cold blasts of air from the Arctic can still come down and basically hit the east part of Britain. 
Now, people go, oh, it's a really cold winter. No, it wasn't. We had two or three days of intense snow, and then it all melted. I mean, my, my children are really upset that they might get one snow day, perhaps two, you know, and then it's all gone. So the winters are still much warmer and wetter than usual, but we just have these cold snaps, just like we have these major heat waves during summer. So we need to actually think about changing our infrastructure. So improving the Thames barrier, uh, making sure the Dawlish railway line isn't uh, uh, destroyed again by sea level rise. And so we have to think about our infrastructure. And if we look at the global effects more widely of climate change, we were seeing already more storms, floods, droughts, heat waves which have led to all the huge wildfires that we've seen recently in Australia and California. It also may lead to food and water insecurity because with that climate and weather variability, it's less possible to produce food on a consistent basis. And I stress this, may lead to migration and conflict. And again, people have used any excuse to basically fight with each other and people mainly move for economic reasons so it's an interesting debate whether climate change will exacerbate current migration and conflicts so the un paris agreement says to avoid cutting uh, avoid climate change we need to cut our emissions to net zero by the middle of this century and they say, quite honestly, to achieve this, we would need to completely transform our energy generation, our industry, infrastructure, and our personal behaviors. And this is why. So the red line is where we've actually got to on our emissions. So with fossil fuel, industry, and land use, we're above 40 billion tons of CO2 emissions per year. And if we want to stick to a one and a half degree, we need to get to net zero. So that means that the amount that we emit is then actually absorbed some way through reforestation or through sort of carbon capture and storage. But we have to get to globally net zero by 2050. And then this is what people, particularly scientists, don't tell the public, which is, yeah, then we need to have negative emissions for the rest of the century to basically keep sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to ensure that we keep to that one and a half degrees. So people ask, did COVID uh, make a difference? Because remember, we all stopped flying. We stopped using our cars. We basically didn't go on holidays. We felt like we didn't do anything. Actually, the change was basically a drop of about 7%, which made 2020 the emissions about the same as 2006. And the reason being is because most of the emissions globally are due to our energy generation and our food production. And so therefore, our personal control is rather small. So stopping flying, stopping driving our car had a very small effect on the global emissions. So how do we get to this net zero carbon emissions? Well, we need government to actually enforce policies, provide subsidies, and to regulate and incentivize. We need corporations and businesses to really think about how they do business how they can actually build the circular economy. And we need individuals to demand that business and government to do that, but also that we take responsibility and start to change our own behaviors. What's really interesting is that estimates suggest that by going carbon neutral, we could actually save the world $46 trillion. So we can save money at the same time as saving the planet. So ultimately, what we need are win-win solutions that incorporate what individuals can do, governments can do, 
and of course companies can do and we're all part of the same team and i'm looking forward to in future conversations actually talking about what those solutions are and how we as individuals can actually make a difference that's fantastic thank you so much mark and seeing all that laid out in that way creates this sense of urgency that we all have and i think it's really critical that you laid out there what are the three components you know the the governments the individuals and also the the companies and corporations can do and we're going to be delving into it right especially with your new book Thank you. Um, and we'll, <laughs> we'll cover the points in the, in the next interview that we have. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about those solutions that we can all do. For, for me, I think that the power of the individual is really important because we can make small changes in our lifestyle that actually send huge messages to companies and to governments. But I have to say, we have to be very careful not to fall into that climate change denier trap that it's all our fault as individuals. I think we have to be careful about that guilt because actually when they say, well, you choose to fuel your car with petrol, you choose to fly on a holiday, etc. Actually, that's not true because if there was a choice and when there is choice, many of us actually do choose to do the more sustainable thing. But at the moment, because fossil fuels are hard locked into our economy, it's very difficult for us and even companies to actually make the right choices. So what we need to do is send messages to companies and to governments say, we're happy to change, but you need to actually do the heavy lifting. You need to help us do the right thing. For sure. So yeah, for today, thank you so much, Mark, and look forward to our next session that we have together. Pleasure. I look forward to it. Bye for now.